I am starting a brand new small account challenge. Today is day one, and in this episode, I'm gonna share with you the strategy that I'm gonna be using to grow this account. Okay, GMBL just hit two of my best scanners. I am gonna see if I can get in this for the break of six. Let's see, I can buy just under a thousand. No, Phil, I chased it, 600 shares at 650. There's seven, 749, 718, 748. I'm gonna take it off the table here. I sold too soon. You know what? Don't be greedy, be grateful. And just like that, I broke the ice with my first trade. Now, let's lay some ground rules for this day trading challenge. To mimic what it's like as a beginner day trader, I'm gonna use just two pieces of equipment. This old laptop that has not one, not two, but three broken keys. And I'm gonna use this 24 inch monitor that was dropped on the ground and is broken. And we were gonna throw it away, but you know what? As a beginner day trader, you make do with what you've got. Now, when it comes to account size, I funded this account with a thousand bucks. And I know some of you already are saying, hold up, Ross. I just saw you buy 600 shares of a stock at $6.50. I'm no mathematician, but 600 shares times 650 equals at least $3,600, maybe a little bit more. You are correct. Okay, so here's what I'm doing with my account. I set up an international account. And the reason I did that was because I did not want to be limited in how many times I could trade each day or be required to have a large account. There's another thing that comes with using international brokers. International brokers will give you different amounts of leverage. All right, so what does all this mean? What it means is that when I funded this account that I'm using right now with $1,000, $1,000, I have six times leverage, which means I have $6,000 of buying power. And that allowed me to buy up to a thousand shares of a $6 stock. Now, this broker does have some rules about how leverage works. One of their rules is that you can only use leverage on stocks over $5. So for this challenge, I'm probably not going to be able to trade anything below $5 for a while, not until my account has gotten bigger. Right now, I actually have a sweet spot, and that sweet spot is a stock between five and seven. Okay, so now let's talk about strategy. The strategy that I'm gonna be trading during this small account challenge is a little bit different than the strategy that I trade with my main account. Obviously, I'm gonna be focusing on stocks of a slightly different price range. I'm gonna be focusing on taking trades at slightly different places. And ultimately, all of this comes down to me having to be very, very careful. Because when you have a small account, you don't have a lot of cushion, you don't have a lot of room to make mistakes. So I know what this was like because I've been in this place with a small account many times before. This is not my first challenge. My hope is that by demonstrating the way I trade in this account, it'll be inspiring for those of you who are earlier in your learning curve and who are trading in a small account, not as a challenge by, by sort of a uh, choice, but because that's really your only option. Okay, so this is what the small account strategy is gonna look like. I first have to find a stock that is trending higher each day. I'm a momentum trader, so I'm looking for stocks that are moving higher. I'm gonna look to buy the first pullback with a tight stop using a two to one profit to loss ratio. My target is $100 to $200 of profit per day with a $1,000 account. Obviously today in my first trade, I broke the ice and blew that out of the water with $460 of profit. Now that was just my first trade today. I took a total of three trades today. I haven't shared them all with you yet. So you're gonna find out what happens on trade two and trade three as we go through this episode. But let's start high level. So when it comes to strategy, what is gonna be my approach for finding stocks to trade? Now, by the way, for those of you who have been tuned in for a while, you know my strategy pretty well. You've probably watched me trade and throw down some pretty big size and make some pretty big money. For my small account strategy, things are gonna be a little different. So what I would encourage you to do is if you check down in the description, pinned to the top of the comments and in the description, there is a link where you can actually download my small account strategy PDF. It is a worksheet that breaks down the small account strategy. So it's a document that you can print out. You can have it next to your desk and you can use it as a resource 
for yourself if you're also trading in a small account. Now, this worksheet is going to include a couple of different setups that I'm going to be trading a lot during the next several weeks of this challenge. So I encourage you to click that link. It's put, pinned to the top of the comments and it's in the description. Download that worksheet, print it out, and then you'll have it on your desk. Okay, so what I'm going to be focusing on in terms of the type of stocks, I'm going to be looking, number one, for stocks that are moving quickly. All right, so I want to find a stock that has the potential to go up at least 10%. Now, if we jump onto the whiteboard here just for a moment, the standard deviation for most stocks in the S&P 500, and, and even just most stocks in general, is that they don't go up or down more than about 4% on any given day. This is plus four, and this is minus four. So 99% of stocks in the market stay within these sort of standard deviation bands. They don't really move. Okay. Okay. So when a stock does break outside of that, it is sort of an anomaly of the day. It's doing something really special. So what you see here on my screen share, these are the characteristics that I have identified that give the highest likelihood of a stock making a really big move. Now, if I'm trading with a $1,000 account, which obviously I am, I need stocks that are going to move. So let's jump onto the whiteboard uh, again just for a moment and I'll show you an example. Okay, so let's say we have a stock that's at $5. I want this stock to go to $5.50. Now, if I put my entire account into that trade, as you know, I have $1,000 cash, but I have $6,000 of buying power, which means I can actually buy 1,000 shares of this stock. It's $5,000 to buy it. Now, I actually own 5,000 shares of this real company. So I'm not risking $5,000, so to speak, because for me, I can turn around and sell this stock at any time on the market. So really my risk is the difference between my entry price and where I'm willing to sell it at a loss. So let's say my risk on this is $4.90. So in that case, I'm risking only $100. It's $100 of risk. Now let's say my profit target is 550. All right, so if it goes up to 550, I'm gonna make $500 of profit. Now on the $5,000 position, this is a return of 10%, right? 1,000 shares times $5 a share is $5,000 position. It's a 10% return, I'm up 500 bucks. But because I've used leverage, my account is up 50%. So on that first trade where I'm up 460 bucks, now I didn't get a 46% return on that trade, but my account is up 46% because of the use of leverage. Remember, leverage is a sword that cuts both ways. You have to be very careful with leverage. I feel comfortable using it because of how long I've been trading. So leverage for me is a tool that allows me to grow my account faster than if I didn't use it. But ultimately, this tool doesn't work if you don't know how to use it correctly. And it certainly doesn't work if you're not applying it to the right type of stocks. So I'm looking for stocks that have the potential to make big moves. Let me pose a question for you for a moment. I want you to think about what is the fastest way that you could blow up an account right now? That you could blow up an account, destroy it. It's gone. It's zero. In fact, it's negative. What would be the fastest way you could do that? If I was going to speculate, I would say if I was going to try to blow up an account, and I mean epically blow up an account, what I would do is I would short a small cap stock with a really low float that has good news and high relative volume. Those are the types of stocks that we see go crazy. Just this last week, we saw a stock that went from $25 a share to over $500 a share. And if you had shorted 4,000 shares of that, you could have lost over a million bucks. Because that's the thing with short selling. The amount that you can lose is actually unlimited. So certainly in, for this small account challenge, I will not be shorting stocks because I don't want that quick ticket to blowing up my account. I also don't want to pay the borrowing locate fees to borrow shares to short them because I don't have a lot of money in my account. But the reason I asked you this question was because I want you to think about the fastest way to blow up an account. If the fastest way to blow up an account is to short a small cap, you know, low float stock with news that's moving higher, then perhaps the fastest way to
to grow an account would be to buy, not short, buy a stock that is a low float, has news, and is squeezing up today. In fact, it is. Those are the types of stocks that I have consistently made the most money on. This is my track record. I've been trading for a really long time. So what I have identified, and I'll just show you, uh, these are these are my own metrics, my, my own trading met metrics right here. This is showing you that, <laughs> that basically all of my profit is on stocks that have five times relative volume, which is 500 times higher volume uh, today than the last 50 days average. Why would a stock have 500 times higher volume today than the last 50 days? News. There's some type of news. Now it could be technical and it is technical sometimes, but there's something happening. There's an event happening. There's a catalyst. And, and if you look at my performance by um, <laughs> over on this side by the uh, by the percentage change, you'll see that basically all of my profit is on stocks that are up more than 10% on the day. Okay, so it's logical, therefore, that at a minimum criteria, we say I have to choose stocks that are up at least 10% on the day. I should choose stocks that have the potential to have five times higher volume than their 50-day average. Five times is, is great. That means there's usually something happening that's special. And number three, I would prefer to trade a stock that has breaking news. Now, I'm not always going to be lucky and get great breaking news. In fact, I actually know some traders who say <laughs> they never read the news headlines. This is interesting because other traders I'll sometimes see, and I've done this myself. I have I get uh, migraine headaches. I actually have a little bit of a headache up here right now. Um, so. I, I remember one day when I was trading, I saw a stock that said they had news from treating migraines. And I was like, this news looks legitimately awesome. So what did I do? I bought a ton of shares and the stock dropped and dropped and dropped and I lost a lot of money. And I was like, gosh darn it, but that news was so good. Yeah, the news was good, but you know, the chart wasn't good. So as day traders, we have to focus number one on the technicals. So yes, it's good when a stock has news, um, but it's also okay if it doesn't have news because ultimately at the end of the day, what we wanna see is that the stock is moving. So the stock that I traded this morning, it was moving quickly. It was already up over 10% on the day. The relative volume was increasing, all right? It was in the right price range being between two and 20. Now, right now, because the restriction that my broker has set, I can't use my leverage on stocks under $5. So I have been patiently waiting for a stock sort of right perfectly between five and six or seven, where I could buy about a thousand shares. Because a thousand shares would allow me to take a big enough position that even if I only get 15 or 20 cents per share of profit, I could still consider that to be a pretty good day for day one, you know, $150, $200. I obviously far exceeded that with trade number one. Uh, wait to see trade number two. But nonetheless, I got in the green on trade number one and, and that was good. So the price is important. That's the fourth uh, criteria. And then number five is the float, the number of shares available to trade. So what I have found consistently is that the stocks that make the biggest moves have lower floats. Even GameStop, the float was only like 36, maybe 40 million shares. That's a very low float. When you think about stocks like, I don't know, Ford or Bank of America that have sold billion shares onto the market. So float is the number of shares available to trade. And it's a fixed number. When a company does their initial public offering, they sell shares onto the open market. And from that point forward, that's the number of shares that are available to trade. Now it can go up if they do secondary offerings, if they sell more shares on the market, it can go down if they do share buybacks. But for the most part, the number of shares available is a fixed number. And what's important to know here is that this represents the supply. So when you have these characteristics of demand, you have five times relative volume, you have a stock that's up more than 10%, there's a news event, the stock's priced between one and, and 20, it's that sort of sweet spot where traders like myself can buy a lot of shares and do well. That's when we see high demand, low supply, we see those big moves. That's the type of momentum that I'm looking for. In fact, that's the type of momentum I need if I'm gonna grow this small account. 
Now, some people can be a little critical of trading low float stocks. They'll say, oh, you know, these low float stocks, you know, these are risky. They're going to have bigger spreads. You know, they're not as safe as trading something like Tesla or, or, or Facebook or Netflix or something like that. On the one hand, I can agree with you that the spreads will be bigger and they will be more volatile. On the other hand, when I look around the room, and I look at all of my members at Warrior Trading who have earned profitability badges, who have earned 100K, 500K, million dollar badges. They haven't done it trading large cap stocks like Facebook or Tesla or Netflix. They've done it trading small cap stocks, volatile stocks, stocks that have the potential to go up 50% or 100% in one day. These are the stocks where traders, retail traders like you and I are making money. What's important though, is that we're focusing on the obvious stock each day because it's true that you know you can have these email services that email out out or send text message alerts telling everyone to buy a stock buy a stock and all of a sudden the price will go up and that's not really a strong catalyst i'd prefer a catalyst that's based on some type of news event so what i do which is a little different from other people is i wait for the stock to start moving once the stock starts moving I'm jumping on the moving train. Okay, so I already showed you a little bit of my metrics right here. Uh, in order for me to find stocks that are moving, what you may have noticed when you were looking at my trade this morning on GMBL was at the bottom corner of my monitor, there were some stock scanners. So what I actually did was I hired a team of developers, they work for me, and they built out a set of stock scanners. And what these scanners are doing is they're searching the market in real time for stocks that meet my five criteria for having the potential to make a big move. Now in the past, before I had a scanner like this, what was I doing? People, what were other people doing? People were going on message boards, they were going on social media, they were just sort of asking people, hey, what's moving, what's moving, what's moving? And it was a very disjointed and difficult way of figuring out what was moving in the market. So when I brought on my development team, what we do is we subscribe to market data and we filter all of the data. So we run these servers on Amazon. We have all of this data coming in. And what we're doing is we're filtering out all of the junk and we're looking for stocks that meet my criteria for having the potential to make these big moves. And that's what you see in my scanners. So this is the tool that I'm using. Now, as a trader, you need tools because if you don't have tools, you won't be able to find stocks to day trade. If you don't have the right broker, you won't be able to execute your trades. So there are a certain set of tools that we need every day in order to trade successfully. So this is what my layout looks like. I've got my charts over on the right side and I've got my scanners on the left side. And each day, step number one is finding the leading gainer. Guess what it was today? GMBL. That was a stock at that moment that was the leading gainer. Okay. So what was my workflow? The second that stock hit the scanner, what did I do? It hits the scanner. So I see it at the top of the scanner. I see the audio, I hear the audio alert because I have audio alerts set on my scans. So even if I'm outside, I turn my speakers way up. If I'm making some coffee or I'm doing whatever, I hear the audio alert and I come rushing over to see what's moving. Those audio alerts are a Pavlovian response because I know those can mean money in my pocket. And that is literally what happened today. Okay, so step number one, I look at the stock hitting the scanner, I look at the top gapper, I check the news, and then I'm looking for my favorite chart pattern. And all of that happens super, super fast. So what I try to do for our members is I try to sort of slow that down by doing these recaps after the fact and explaining, okay, this is the stock that I saw, this is what I liked about it, this is where I got in, this was sort of in that fraction of a second, this was how much due diligence I did. I checked the price, I checked the float, I checked the, um, the relative volume, I checked to see what the catalyst was, and then I'm looking at the stock chart. Okay, so in the case of my first trade today, I, I fumbled this one. I fumbled this one a little bit. It was, you know, first day jitters with the new, new account, uh, <laughs> trading on this piece of garbage. Well, I, I, I don't wanna be too critical. It's computer sitting right here, earmuffs, earmuffs. This, this computer has three broken keys. It's not, it's not what it used to be. This monitor is garbage. And in fact, um, something that, 
that I really am looking forward to is replacing this monitor with something a little bit better. So as part of this small account challenge, you guys have some control. There's two things you can control. The first is you can force me to reset my account back to a thousand bucks. That will happen when we cross 10,000 new subscribers as of today's date. So the number of subscribers we have now, I'm looking at it and it's plus 10,000. You will force me to reset my account back to a thousand bucks. Okay, so you've got some control. You share this video with some friends, you get some more subscribers, you're gonna push that reset date and make it even sooner. Okay, the second thing that you have control over is my trading station. And this is what I'm calling my inventory. So I'm beginning this challenge with this laptop and this computer. And every time we get 10,000 thumbs up on the videos in this series, you will help me unlock my next piece of equipment. Now, I definitely want to replace this monitor and get another one. I'd like to have three. I'm probably going to be okay with having one crappy one. And eventually I'll get all nice ones. Once we get to 20,000, 30,000, 40,000, 50,000 thumbs up on videos in this whole series. I also need to get a traveling monitor because I would like to travel a little bit this year. And I'd like to upgrade this computer to a newer one. So you guys have some control by hitting the thumbs up. You're going to help unlock new inventory. And by subscribing to the channel, you're going to help. Well, you're going to force my next reset back down to a thousand bucks. But here's the ground rules. I get to keep the inventory that I've collected. So when I reset back to a thousand bucks, I don't have to go back to the old inventory. I get to keep what I've earned. OK, so that makes this a little bit more interesting and a little bit more fun. OK, so today, yes, my workflow is a little bit scrambled. Typically, my process of getting into a trade is a little bit smoother, but today was a little sloppy. All right, so we're going to look at the example of today's first trade, and we're going to look at the second and the third trade in a moment. But before we do, let's look at the perfect chart pattern. OK, so I look for my favorite chart pattern. This is what I love to see. All right, so what are we looking at here? We're looking at a stock that squeezed up quickly. It went from five to six to seven, all the way up to 775. Then it pulled back right around seven, and now it's curling back up to eight. And the pullback there, that was the place to be a buyer for that next leg up. So what's happening here psychologically is we have a stock that is clearly very strong, but the move got sort of exhausted. It squeezed up, 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 up. But then at a certain point, buyers, they weren't willing to keep buying that high. And people that were in at a lower price started to say, you know what, I think I'm going to take a little profit off the table. And so they started to press the sell button. And so we got this squeeze up and then a little bit of exhaustion. But something really important happens here. The stock doesn't drop completely. It doesn't do a complete reversal. It pulls back and then it kind of bases out. Okay. So the way I look at this is like a wave. It's the wave up, a little pullback, and is this going to be the next wave higher? Now, this is a difficult moment for a lot of beginner traders because if we look at the whiteboard here, it could be hard for you as a beginner to differentiate the difference between this is a pullback and I should buy it versus that's going to happen, right? And I've been there. I know what that's like. So how do you know that it's going to go like this and not like this? Okay, so let me walk you through how this pattern works. This is a pullback pattern. This is the pattern that I'm going to be trading during this small account challenge. So what I'm looking for is a stock to make a strong move up and then pull back. Now, what's important to note, and I'm going to jump onto the whiteboard here, is there are a couple of levels that cannot be broken. So first, the stock starts squeezing up here. Now, if for example, the stock comes back down here and back down here. This would be okay. If it goes like this, that would not be okay. All right, so what I say is that I don't like to see a stock retrace more than approximately 50% of the move. So I just eyeball it. It's not an exact science, but if it pulls back more than 50% of the move, I feel like it's too weak. So psychologically, there's sort of a point of control, kind of like a tug of war. But when it crosses a certain line, we're on the weak side, not on the strong side. So I, I draw that line at 50%. Okay, so if the stock pulls back, you know, a little bit, 25%, whatever, 30%, that's okay. Usually I look for one, two, maybe three candles. If we get four candles or five candles, 
at a certain point, it's like this stock is just pulling back too much. Traders are sort of not interested in it. If we pull back for only one candle, the only problem with that is that sometimes the stock hasn't really pulled back enough to attract a new round of buyers to come into it because buyers will still feel like it's a little extended. So ultimately, one of the best pullbacks is going to be when the stock comes back to the nine EMA on the one minute time frame. And it's usually going to be a couple of green candles and then, you know, one or two or maybe three red candles just like that. That's the proper pullback. Now, the entry on this pattern is to buy the first candle that makes the new high. So we're looking for that first candle to make a new high. And if you look at it on the whiteboard, let's say the high of this candle right here, the high of that candle is $3. Okay, do I buy when this candle closes? No, I buy the second the stock breaks over $3. Now, what you're gonna see when we look at my second trade today, you're going to see that I did a trade to try to anticipate a break over a, a whole dollar. In this case, it was seven. So let's take a peek at trade number two from today. Okay, so GMBL right now is consolidating right above volume weight average price. I think if it can hold over seven, we could get a move back up towards the high. So I've got my order ready to go to buy here for the break of seven. I'm just watching it for a second. I'm looking for a little more green on the tape. There we go. Okay, I'm in there at seven. There's a hidden seller. It's not breaking. It should have already broken. Okay, back to 83 on the bid. Okay, let's see. I'm gonna see if this, there's a still green on the tape though, but back to 71 on the bid. Ah, shoot. Man, ah, seven, oh man, shoot. I'm gonna have to bail on this. Ah. All right, I gotta cut it. Darn it, wow. Okay, so, whew, easy come, easy go, man. That's trading, wow. All right, so now I'm down $23 on the day. Shoot. That was literally devastating. <laughs> I, I went from up $460, the best first day I've ever had in a small account challenge, and now I am red 23 bucks. What just happened? That's now the biggest loss I've ever had on day one of a small account challenge. But don't worry, I still have a third trade coming soon. All right, we'll find out what happens on trade number three. But let's talk about what just happened on that trade. Okay, so on that trade, the stock had popped up, it squeezed up, we'll, we'll jump on the whiteboard here, it squeezed up and then had pulled back and it was right under $7. Okay, so in that case, the entry, the high of this candle was $7. Schmuck that I am, I bought at $6.98. My God, I bought to anticipate the break instead of waiting for the break to happen. Okay, I got a little eager. I got excited. I am excited. I'm amped up. This is so exciting. It's a new small account challenge. So I jumped in to anticipate that it was gonna break. I thought it was gonna break, but you know what happened was we had a hidden seller right there at $7. And in this case, rather than cut the loss quickly and just bail out, I mean, honestly, at best, I was looking at a 20 cent loss on it. And my target was 750 and it moved back up to eight. So the profit loss ratio was okay, but instead of cutting it at 680 or 675, I held until the half dollar of 650. And I lost a full 50 cents on it. That's a, that's a pretty big loss. A little bit of emotion came in there. I got stubborn, but finally I capitulated, which means I gave in and I cut the loss. All right, so now I'm down 23 bucks. All right, so the lesson here is confirmation is important. I need to see it actually break this level. And so what that means is that I, when I'm looking at the chart, I want to see right there at seven, a lot of green on the tape. And you know what? I, I'm not, I shouldn't fault myself too much for this trade because it really could have worked. It just, this one just didn't. Probably the only thing I did wrong was instead of cut it at um, $6.80, I let it go an extra 30 cents against me and I got a little stubborn. That's really the biggest mistake from that trade. So, but best case scenario is it breaks that level and it goes back up, boom, up through new highs. And now we're looking really good. Okay, so let's look back at the slides here. All right, so when we're talking about buying these pullbacks, 
the entry, and I'm going to read this to you. Um, I, I don't expect you to read it yourself because it's kind of small. It'll be small print on your computer. So the first candle to make a new high is the entry. That's the apex point. All right. The apex point of either a bull flag or a flat top pattern. It's the break of that new high. That first candle to make a new high. Sometimes I will enter early to anticipate the breakout as I did on that last trade. If I'm early, what typically triggers that entry is either a breakthrough psychological resistance like a whole dollar or a half dollar, or I'm getting in just below the level because I think it's going to break because I'm seeing that surge on the level two. We'll talk about level two more in just a moment. I would always prefer to have an early entry because it, it offsets the risk of a false breakout, but this was an example of that early entry not paying off. Now, almost immediately upon entry, I want to see if the price is moving up. Okay, that's where things went wrong on this trade. I got in, but the price did not move up. It stalled out. It dropped. If the price moves down immediately, my timing is wrong. If I have a starter position, I may hold with a stop at the low of the pattern, or I should cut my loss. In this case, I had my full position, and I was not emotionally prepared to sell it and I held it too long. Emotions run higher when you're in with full size. So if I go right on a trade almost immediately, I do start to change perspective from this being a winner to just mitigating the loss. Can I get out break even or for only a 10 cent loss? But in this case, I just, I had to bail. So this is the type of trade that when it works, it works pretty much immediately, like the first trade did. I'm just immediately green. And when it doesn't work, well, it stalls for a second and then flushes. This one stalled for a second and then it flushed. So it was not, it wasn't, it just unfortunately wasn't perfect. Now, the target for this type of trade is a retest of high a day. So in the case of the example uh, right here, we're looking at a move back up to the high. In the case of the example that I took on um, the stock today, I was looking for a retest of $8. Back to $8 would have been awesome. $7.50 is the first target, that's 50 cents away but $8 is what I was hoping for. Um, sometimes when a stock is really extended, we've had um, a really big move. What will end up happening is we'll have the candles going up, we'll have the pullback, it'll come back up, but it's not able to surge through the high and it'll pull back a second time here and then it'll go on this final attempt and this is called an ABCD pattern. It kind of looks like a W there, um, but this is this is called an ABCD pattern. And, and the, the breakout is, is still right about at this level for that move higher. So that's a little bit of a more complex pattern. I, I may trade that during this um, small account challenge. I probably will at some point, but, um, but that, that just wasn't what happened to set up on that trade um, today. So when we're talking about the first pullback, I think that this is, in grand scheme of things, a lower risk uh, setup as far as all the setups are concerned. The stops are usually pretty tight. The patterns are pretty obvious. They're well respected. Uh, a false breakout can create a dramatic, uh, what I would call a little bit of a jackknife where it pops up like this, but then immediately reverses back down and you get that big whip. That's not fun. Um, that tends to happen when the stock has been going sideways for a while. You know, the longer they go sideways, they start to do these drops and pops and pops and drops. So it's really better to be focusing on trading these when they're moving up quickly. When they start kind of going sideways, that's when I find more of the chop happens of the, of the false breakouts. Uh, stop losses for this trade and this pullback pattern is going to be the low of the last pullback. So the, essentially the low of the last wave. And that's why... If I get in this type of trade, when it, the stock first starts squeezing up here, if I get in like right up here, the low of the last wave is like way down here. It's really far away. So like I need a little bit of a pullback here. So when I'm getting in here, my new stop is the low of this last wave. That's a much better way to manage risk than to be buying at the very top of an extension. Obviously, there are situations where I'll buy a stock that's more extended, that's going to be a higher risk setup. And it's one that I'm going to have to be more careful about during this small account challenge. For the first pullback pattern, and this, this is the strategy that I'll be trading during this challenge, my profit target is going to be 10 to 20 cents. 40 cents, 50 cents is going to be phenomenal. Um, I, I may not get that. I was considering setting actual profit targets where I would take everything off the table if I hit 20 cents. I decided not to do that. 
And the reason is because I don't want to cap my winners. I'd like to cap my losers, but I don't want to cap my winners. And today is a good example. I had a, a trade that went far higher than I expected, and I was able to make much more on it as a result of holding it until I sort of saw an exit indicator. And we're going to talk about exit indicators in a moment. Um, so, and again, this is all documented in, in detail in my small account worksheet, which you guys can download. It'll be pinned to the uh, top comment down in the comments, and it'll also be linked in the description. So I do encourage you guys to download that worksheet so you can print it out. You could have it next to your desk while you're trading. And my goal ultimately is always to help beginner traders. So by giving you this portion of my trading plan and sort of my strategy, if it helps you in any way in your trading, that's phenomenal. I'm super happy for that. So I hope you comment below if you find it helpful. And uh, of course, I hope you do hit the thumbs up and subscribe because I really am looking to replace this monitor ASAP. And if you subscribe, well, you're going to force me to reset my account back to $1,000. And that's certainly going to keep things interesting. Okay, so um, a note here in a particularly strong market, rather than sell a partial position, like sell half, I may actually add to the position. Now, I couldn't do that today because I was using my basically all of my buying power on the trades. Um, and, and I'm going to talk about that component of my strategy a little bit more. It's also documented in that worksheet in terms of buying power. But, um, but I, I wasn't able to do that today. Okay. So once I have executed the trade, I have pressed the buy button. Now I'm in the position. What am I focusing on? Obviously, I still am looking at the chart, but my eye moves to something else. My eye starts focusing on the level two. The level two to me is the road in front of me. The stock chart is historical price action. That's what's already happened. It's already over. It's helpful because it gives us context and we can see indicators in that uh, previous price action of, you know, a, a candlestick that indicates indecisiveness or a possible reversal is coming. So there are messages that we can receive. But at the same time, I like to keep my eyes looking forward. And that means I'm going to be focusing on the level two. Okay, so um, the level two is also called the depth of the market. And this is where every single order that is coming to the public market is going to be displayed. Now, I say public market because today the markets are very segregated. We have dark pools. The orders on dark pools do not go into the lit market. A lit market is uh, transparent. You can see the orders. A dark pool is hidden. You can't see the orders. The alternative trading systems that are used by a lot of these big wholesalers do not route their orders out to the main market. They sometimes do, but oftentimes they don't. So... Level two is um, it's it's the it's it's a depth of the market of the publicly traded markets or, or the publicly visible uh, routes in the market, and I kind of think of level two as an island where the orders come and where they the the trade actually happens. And so when I'm looking at the level two, my eye is looking at the ask price. So the ask is on the right. I'm looking at the ask price. I look at the bid and I'm looking at the spread. So the spread is the difference between the bid and the offer. Okay, so when we have a stock, for instance, like the stock that I was trading today, and we have um, $6.90 on the bid, and we have $7 on the ask, we have a $0.10 cent spread. So this is the ask, this is the bid. And I'm looking at the ask, and then I'm also looking down here, $7.05, $7.15, $7.25. I'm looking to see how far away the next orders are. I'm looking to see how far apart they are. Oh, they're about five cents apart. Okay. Then that tells me that if the stock starts to move, we could go up to 705, 715, 725 fairly quickly. If instead I saw it was like 701, 02, 03, I'd be like, man, this thing is it's gonna take a, a bit of buying to get it to there. And one of the other things that we'll see on the level two is the number of shares for sale. So if we see 10,000, 10,000, 20,000, 50,000. I'm telling you, this stock's not going to budge. That thing's not moving. So by looking at the level two, I can see the orders that are stacked up. And that gives me a sense of how quickly this stock may or may not move up to maybe the next, uh, the, my next profit target. And I, I see the same thing on the bid. So if I see on the bid 690, but a, let's just say 500,000 share order, I'm going to be like, holy smokes, there's a huge buyer here. That's a huge level of support. 
So someone is supporting this stock at that price. I could feel pretty confident buying this at seven. The inverse would be true if it was a seller on the ask. So I look very closely at the level two. And what I like to see is that once I've gotten in, I want to see signs of strength. So what does strength look like? I see the strength in the level two. I see it in the form of green on the tape. Green on the tape is the time in sales. So the time in sales is showing every single order that's going through the book. And when I see green on the tape, that tells me that a lot of people are buying. Green means the order is going through at or above the ask price. An order in red is going through at or below the bid. And an order in white is going through between the spread. So I don't care much for white. I do not like red. And green, I love. So what I want to see after I've initiated the trade and pressed the buy button. So when I got in at 698, we saw some green at seven and then it stalled out. I want to see green on the tape. I want to see the number of shares on the ask getting smaller, which tells me that the buyers are accumulating that seller and that the price is going to break and go up to the next level. So the price should be moving up, hopefully fairly quickly. And obviously I want to see that the stock is pretty soon going to be hitting new highs because if it's hitting new highs, that means the stock is going to be back on high of day momentum scanners and high frequency trading algorithms. They're looking for stocks that are hitting these scanners. And when stocks start moving quickly, these high frequency trading algorithms react. There's quite a bit of complexity that I could get into about how they work. I'm going to save that for another episode. So just for right now, the things that I look for, green on the tape, the stock moving higher, ideally hitting the high day momentum scanner. And I would like to see that the price it really is jumping pretty quickly. And what I don't want to see is that uh, all of a sudden everything stalls. So if these are signs of strength, then what I would say um, ultimately would be signs of weakness or exit indicator would be if suddenly a big seller appears on the level two, the 50,000 share seller. That's a sign of weakness. That's not good. If I see all of a sudden a burst of red going through the time and sales, someone's selling. I don't like that. If all of a sudden the, the stock just sort of stalls out. In fact, the absence of strength by itself can be an exit indicator. And I should have, I, I should have taken that uh, to heart today on my second trade. On my second trade, I really did hold that uh, for, for much longer than I should have. I should have bailed faster, but I'm telling you, uh, it's even though that position, 1,000 shares is like such a small position for me normally, in this context, my adrenaline was pumping. I was like, uh-oh, here we go. This is either make it or break it, do or die, hero or zero. And after trade number two, I feel like a little bit of a zero. All right, so... Let me show you a few more examples of this pattern of trading the first pullback. And then I'm going to show you trade number three for today. Okay, so the first and second pullback here, this is another example where you see a stock that's made a nice move. And look, this stock went from $4 to 6 to 8 It just keeps going higher. This is great. This is what we love to see. The best place to be buying these types of stocks is on a pullback. If you're buying in the middle of the move up, it's going to be higher risk. I, again, I'm not going to say I won't sometimes do that. I have a high degree of educated intuition, so I can feel comfortable taking that risk. Um, by the way, just um, for the sake of it. So I took my first trades when I was a teenager. Uh, this is my book, How to Day Trade the Plain Truth. Uh, thank you guys who have already gotten a copy. You, you helped make it a bestseller on Amazon. Um, you're, all, you're all welcome to get copies if you'd like. It's... Um, so this is a picture of me. This was when, look at, look at me, I'm just a little fella. That's when I took my first trades. I was in middle school. I was in middle school when I started paper trading. I was in high school when I executed my first trades with real money. And when I started trading uh, full time, I actually did it as a New Year's resolution. I made a commitment to myself that I was going to start getting up early, sitting down and watching the markets. Oops because I knew there was potential. I knew there was potential in the market. I, and I felt like I had, I had to take it seriously. So for me, with all of this educated intuition, I do sometimes take trades that are higher risk. And even during this small account challenge, I'll tell you right now, my results, they're not gonna be typical. They're not gonna be typical of what you should expect if you start an account with $1,000. Let's get real. 
I've made millions and millions of dollars trading. I've been doing this for a long time. So I have a special skill set. But I like doing these small account challenges because even for me, it's still a challenge. And it's a great way to get you guys excited, to inspire you, to motivate you. Because you know what? The best time to start learning how to trade was five years ago. The next best time is right now, today. So dig in, let's keep going. All right, so this is the pullback pattern right here, buying the dip and then looking for that move higher. This is another example of a stock that made a really nice move. We're looking for those pullbacks. Those are the spots that I'm gonna be searching for. I'm gonna find the stock initially on my scanners. And then once I've identified the stock is one of the most obvious stocks today, that's when I'm gonna be waiting for that first pullback so I can take my entry. When I'm trading the right stocks, everything else is easier. If I try trading the wrong stocks, the first pullbacks are not going to work. It's not going to respond well. So I have to focus on the right stocks. Now, this is an example here, ASST of a stock that went from about a dollar up to $3.50. Unfortunately, this stock, I wouldn't be able to trade it during this challenge, at least right now, because my account is too small and I'm not allowed to use leverage on stocks under $5. That's just the rule with this broker. Different brokers are different. There's tons of international brokers. You know, the thing with US traders is that we're so accustomed to using US brokers, but US brokers uh, enforce a certain set of rules that are very specific to the United States. But you can trade with international brokers. Any US trader can go to an international broker and say, hey, I'd like to open an account. Now, not all international brokers will accept a US resident, but a lot of them will. And you can say, yeah, I'd like to open an account. And they say, okay, well, you know, we're an international broker, so these are the rules that we have here. This is the minimum account size. This is how much money you need to day trade. This is our, the amount of leverage that we'll give you. So for me, the account that I have, the minimum account size is 500 bucks. I set it up with 1,000. I was like, I'm gonna give myself a little bit of a cushion. And the leverage is six times, but it's only on stocks over $5. So anyways, now, so this is a stock that unfortunately I would not have been able to trade. All right, this is one that I also would not have been able to trade. So this is gonna be a little bit of a shame. There are gonna be stocks where it's like, gosh darn it, I am just not gonna be able to trade it. Now, during this period that I'm doing the small account challenge, if I see opportunities like this and I can't trade in my small account, I'll probably just trade them in my regular account and that's fine. But for the small account on those days, it'll just have to sit on the sidelines. This is an example, again, of a stock that would have been perfect for the small account. It's priced over $5. That meant I would have been able to buy a full thousand shares of it today. I could have gotten in, you know, right or well, actually the first pullback was about 650. So I would have been able to buy about 900 shares of it. Getting in at 650, it goes up to seven, to 750 to eight. So that was a trade very similar to today. It pulls back, it pops up. It does a little bit of that ABCD pattern before going higher up to $9 a share. That's solid. Now, something that I'm going to um, tell you is that I will not be in the habit of buying and just holding for a long time and hoping for a bigger move. I'm going to be aggressive. I have to pay myself. I have to take the profit out of the market. So while it's true that there are some stocks that I could say, gosh, I could have held this and it kept going up and up and up and up. Yes, could have, would have, should have, but... At the end of the day, my job is to pull profit out of the market. And if I can pull out consistently a couple hundred dollars a day from a thousand dollar starting balance, that is awesome. Today, I definitely exceeded it on the first trade, but I gave it back on the second trade. Should we look at the third trade? Let's do it. Okay, so watching resumption here on GMBL, it's currently halted up 755, showing a 778 resumption. I'm looking for the break of eight. I'm not gonna just buy at eight. I've got my order there. I can only afford 660 shares. But what I want is a dip and then the rip. So I'm looking for a dip. All right, 820 high, good, that's great. Can we get a dip? Okay, 796, 750, okay. I'm looking for a little bit of a bigger dip. Seven fifty six. There we go. Okay, okay. Um could this false halt? I'm in at seven. I think I just made a terrible mistake. Well, it appears that I got a dip. I got a much bigger dip than I was expecting. So this is called a false halt setup. This is a false halt gone wrong because a false halt is supposed to be a false halt. This is a real halt. Day one, small account challenge. I am in a halt going down. This is not a good thing.
So for those of you who are new traders, stocks can get halted if they go up more than 10% in less than 10 minutes. Uh, so it's actually five minutes. In less than five minutes. If a stock goes up 10% in less than five minutes, it can get halted. But it's, the true, it's also true going back down. And so what happened in this case is the stock was halted going up. It opened. It did a dip. I was looking to buy the dip for a squeeze back up, but it actually dipped all the way down to the circuit breaker halt going down, and I bought at seven. Now, the reason I bought was because the order started to thin out, and what usually happens is it'll spring back up, and we can get a good 50 cent spring, sometimes even all the way back to the highs. So I am a big fan of doing dip trades. I do think dip trades are gonna be a solid strategy for the small account uh, challenge because I can be getting in sort of on pullbacks where I've got a better profit loss ratio. However, in this case, I ended up getting in a halt down, which is one of the risks of trading false halts. So the good news, and there's not a lot of good news here, the good news is the stock wasn't insanely extended before the, the, the first halt down. In fact, it's, it's back at what was somewhat of a psychological support level of seven. So now what I'm doing is I'm going to be, I, I end up watching the resumption price very closely because a, a halt lasts for five minutes. Now, sometimes they're longer, but typically it's five minutes. So I'm now in the circuit breaker halt and I'm watching the resumption price. The resumption price is pretty steady between 680 and seven, which is more or less flat or down 20 cents. Not great. I don't want to be down $200 on day one of my small account challenge, uh, but at the, end of, at the end of the day, it's not the end of the world. Okay, so what ends up happening is it resumes, and I still have this target of the spring bounce back up to 750. Okay, so let's see what happens. Okay, I was not expecting to be in a halt down on day one of the small account challenge, currently showing 655. However, we had uh, some resistance at seven. I'm hoping that seven is gonna be support. I would like to see us open around seven, opening a little low, like 680 is all right, but I don't wanna to open too low. <sighs> all right, so we're showing 682 right now. I'm gonna watch resumption on this, and my goal on this was a dip at seven and a bounce back up to 750. I'm still looking for a bounce back up to 750. I just am stuck holding during this circuit breaker halt. Okay, so we're open and there's seven. Looking for that bounce back up to 725. 725 is the first target. Then I want to see 750. Okay, there's 725. Seven on the bid. Still looking for that curl. I'm I'm in here right off of support. So this is an entry off support. There's 724. 740, good. 742, can we get 750? 750, great. 777, I'm taking it off the table. From zero back to hero. Okay, taking it all off. Now up $412.21. I should have stopped after the first trade, but you know what? Green is good. I'm going to stop right here. This is still, as of right now, the best day one I've ever had for a small count challenge. I'm taking it off the table. I'm done. So there it is. Day one in the books, $412. That was wild. <laughs> Seriously, today was a roller coaster. The adrenaline was pumping, the blood pressure was high, the beard was looking great, and everything magically came together. Four hundred dollars. That's a, that's an amazing day. Now the only thing is, I do have commissions with this broker. I pay commissions for every ticket that I place, so every trade, so to buy and to sell. So I had a total of three trades, which is uh, six tickets, three buy orders and three sell orders. Okay, so I've got six tickets, and I'm also going to have um, some routing fees. Now, the thing is, I don't know exactly what those are going to be until end of day. So it's actually when I log in tomorrow, I'll see how it's settled. So I am going to have some commissions. I'm not exactly sure how much they're going to be, but although I took six trades, I didn't trade with a lot of share size, so I don't think it's going to be too bad. We'll find out in the next episode. All right, so for right now, what we know is that I made $400, $412 before fees and commissions on day one of the small account challenge. So day one, the account 
is growing. And let's look at the uh, the slides here just to get you a little bit inspired. So this is a day we're trading this same exact setup of buying the first pullback. I locked up ten thousand three hundred and nine dollars. Of course, those results are not typical. Neither were today. Uh, this is a day where I locked up eighty five thousand dollars. This was a pullback pattern right down here where the stock went from eight to nine to 10, 11, 12, all the way up to twenty four dollars a share. Oh my gosh, if I could get a trade like that during this small account challenge, I would just be uh, ecstatic. Here's a day where I locked up $77,000. Again, taking this breakout trade over 1286 right here. So this is a strategy that I trade every single day. I trade it with my large account, but I can trade it all the same with my small account, and I will be trading it in this small account for the foreseeable future. Now, what I am really looking forward to is upgrading this monitor right here. So I hope you've hit the thumbs up. Once we get 10,000 thumbs up on the videos that are in this challenge, it'll unlock my first piece of inventory. Every time we get another 10,000 thumbs up, you'll help me unlock a new piece of inventory. And once we get 10,000 new subscribers, I'm gonna reset my account back to a thousand bucks. All right, I'm going to keep the inventory that I've earned, but I'm going to reset to a thousand bucks. So you can help me get some new inventory. You can help me reset the account and you can join me for the next episode coming real soon. I'm looking forward to seeing you there and I hope you're as excited as I am about this new small account challenge.